Hey there everybody, Sage here, founder of Organic Unity and the School of Evolutionary Herbalism. And happy 2016 to you, uh, first video of the new year here. I hope you all are off to a great start to this new year and, um, and enjoying maybe a little turning within time here during our Mercury retrograde, which will be finishing up this coming uh, Monday. And um, so I'm really excited about new year. I just love the feeling of fresh starts, you know, new beginnings and um, just the inspiration that that brings. And I'm really excited about 2016. We've got some awesome new projects on their way, um, some new programs, some new workshops that I'll be sharing with you. And uh, with this video here, kickstarting the new year off with a five week series here where I want to cover some more in some more content in depth on um, on more the clinical side of herbalism. Uh, for those of you that have been following my work for the last number of years, you know, I tend to um, focus a lot on the philosophy of herbalism the integration of alchemy and medical astrology and um, kind of some more of the esoteric aspects of plant medicine. And um, I'm really passionate about all of that because I realized that oftentimes with herbalism, um, rather than memorizing uses of plants or properties of plants or things like that, sometimes we just take a step back and take a look at the big picture of what is a plant and how is a plant functioning and how is that plant in relationship with the web of life and where do we fit into that and kind of looking at the, the, the forces of nature and how they impact people and plants. And so I talk a lot about that in a lot of my previous blog posts and a lot of the free video series that I've put out in the past and, um, and with a lot of my programs. Um, this year, I'm really excited to be focusing a little bit more, kind of drilling it down a little bit more and talking about um, some more of the clinical side of herbal medicine and kind of how that links in with all of that philosophy that I tend to discuss in a lot of my other videos. So in this video, I'm going to do a little bit of a longer than normal blog post and usually the videos are like five, 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit longer in this one. Um, primarily because I just want to share some more content with you. Um, so, uh, so what I li like to talk about in this video here is um, about the digestive system. And this is so important. Um, this is probably uh, the most important organ system to know how to treat therapeutically um, from a clinical context um, because the digestive system is seen as the root of our vital tree. If we kind of think of the human organism as a tree, like a tree of life, um, really the, the digestive system, it's like the root, it's the foundation, it's whatever, it's what determines the health of the entire organism, much similar to like a tree or a plant, right? If the, if the root system is somehow negatively impacted, if the soil isn't appropriate for the plant, if there's too much moisture or too much dryness or it's too compact or it's too loose, um, etc., then the, the plant or the tree is going to be negatively affected. The whole thing right everything above that root is going to be affected its capacity to grow its capacity to leaf to flower to set fruit uh, etc and so it's a really beautiful analogy for the way our digestive system impacts the wholeness of our organism. And I think this is a really important area of discussion, um, not just in the realm of herbalism, but really kind of from a cultural standpoint too. And the reason I like to mention this is because what we see in relationship to the digestive system is a lot of iatrogenic diseases, a lot of iatrogenic issues in the, in the GI and systemically um, due to overuse of antibiotics. Uh, it's what I call antibiotic trauma that literally because of the over emphasis on the use of antibiotics because of this cultural fear that we have of not all of us, but a lot of people, this cultural fear of germs, right? Of bugs and, you know, of this necessity for everything to be completely sterile. And, um, and of course, you know, cleanliness and sterility is good, but there's an, a point where it gets to be too far, like pushing it too far. And uh, hence, 
the development of drug resistant bacteria and um, therefore the creation of stronger antibiotics and of course as I'm sure all of you know um, that whenever we take an antibiotic it's like an atom bomb for our gut flora right that that our bacteria our, our, that our intestinal tract is inhabited by billions of microorganisms that there's literally a, a whole race of beings living inside of our intestinal tract that I mean they build cities they have um, full it's like a full ecosystem in there of these microorganisms and um, we take an antibiotic it's literally it's like an atom bomb kind of nuking all of that beneficial bacteria that dwells in our intestinal tract and so there we see the creation of kind of this whole slew of problems um, in terms of human health that are either brand new or um, or have have turned into um, bigger issues and um, this is something that I see in my in my clinical practice a lot like really for me the first thing that I'm typically working on with people is restoring their gut health because most people that I see have had to take antibiotics didn't follow up with taking probiotics don't eat fermented foods and display a whole pattern of symptoms that would indicate some form of leaky gut syndrome or um, food intolerance or systemic inflammation um, so that's the other piece of it is that in this in our modern world um, we're not only seeing um, issues with the with gut health and the digestive system due to um, iatrogenic causes of antibiotics but also we see um, uh, the, the whole thing around food intolerance and food allergies, right? This is a really big subject right now that more and more people are coming to realize that um, there's a lot, a lot of the standard foods in um, more of our standard American diet or very common uh, foods that are kind of staples in a lot of uh, Western culture households um, are actually foods that many people are allergic to, uh, primarily being um, gluten containing grains and dairy products. And um, uh, also, you know, we also see people with allergies to corn and soy and eggs, but really the two big ones are gluten and dairy. And, um, and we see that, that through um, elimination of those intolerant foods, we see a whole spectrum of symptoms disappear, like literally disappear from people's lives. Everything from joint pain to um, uh, psychological depression or anxiety or insomnia or heart palpitations, all manner of digestive upset from gas and bloating, diarrhea, constipation, um, uh, to um, all manner of uh, inflammatory responses to in the body to full-blown autoimmune conditions like lupus or fibromyalgia or um, autoimmune thyroiditis and things like that a lot of those things uh, there's tons of research showing that many of those uh, symptoms and full-blown diseases uh, can be due to uh, a direct there's a direct correlation between them and some form of food intolerance food allergy typically juxtaposed next to uh, leaky gut syndrome so so these are all really I would say these are probably some of the biggest topics in the alternative healthcare world and I'll, I'll really kind of permeating into the conventional medical system as well which I think is really really important for uh, everyone to be aware of these dynamics so what we see ultimately without getting into too much detail is that when when the digestive system is compromised the whole system becomes compromised because take for example leaky gut syndrome if your gut wall is supposed to be tight and taut and you know a semi permeable membrane like this and all of a sudden through use of antibiotics through um, chronic inflammation um, through uh, poor diet processed foods um, just uh, genetically modified organisms etc we see that nice tight junction um, gut wall all of a sudden has these gaps in it right it has this um, these kind of holes uh, in the gut wall it's it becomes leaky um, and what essentially that does is that enables um, either foreign 
uh, foreign materials, larger than normal compounds, um, things, anything that we put into our mouth basically um, is able to cross that normally semi-permeable membrane of the gut wall and enter the, the, whole, the whole systemic circulation um, and the body as a whole. So what essentially happens there is that the immune system sees that and is like, whoa, like what is this? This is, a for this is foreign, like this shouldn't be in my body and it launches this immunological reaction, which leads to ultimately inflammation because you know, one of the primary responses of our immune system is to create an inflammatory response. A lot of people really treat inflammation as the enemy and um, really inflammation is, is key. It's like that's an intelligent response of our body. That's our vital force at work. So the inflammation itself really isn't the problem. It's what's triggering the inflammation. And I remember when I was studying at Bastyr, um, what they were saying is like the big kind of research at that time was saying, which was probably like eight years ago or so, they were saying, you know, that a majority of the, the chronic degenerative diseases in Western culture, the, the common denominator is inflammation. And so they're like, okay, we got to attack the inflammation, right? We got to get rid of the inflammation. Hence, turmeric is like this incredibly famous remedy now um, because it's so powerfully anti-inflammatory. But what we see is that people kind of tunnel vision in on the inflammation rather than asking the bigger question of why are they inflamed? Why do they have the inflammation to begin with? Which then takes us another step um, kind of deeper into the root cause of the problem, which brings us back to gut health. Um, so. I wanted to share with you, um, just kind of give you that little bit of an overview about the importance of gut health because it really is t tied into so many other of our organ systems, right? I mean, in, in our digestive system, there's an incredible amount of, the, of our immune system, right, is located in the intestinal tract because it's a, a primary port of entry into the body proper. Now, in, in medicine, they say that from the mouth to the anus is actually considered outside of the body. Something isn't technically considered inside the body until it crosses that gut barrier. So if we think of that, that whole region is the largest kind of um, entryway into the digestive system or into the rest of the body and so our immune system is very heavily uh, present there because it's its job to defend our body from from invading pathogens from foreign um, foreign substances etc so we see a great amount of our immune system there our lymphatic system what they call gut gut associated lymphatic tissue is there um, we see the digestive system intricately interwoven with the pancreas the spleen the liver the gallbladder um, our nervous system right i mean we have tons of serotonin receptors in the digestive system. Um, there's actually a lot of the theories now is that um, things like depression and anxiety really aren't so much a brain chemistry problem as they are actually a digestive system problem. So we see that the state of the digestive system is like that base layer. It's that foundation from which a majority of our other um, organ systems are reliant upon. And if we just think of the state of our agriculture, of our food production, of um, just the way in the standard American diet, we can see kind of the peril of a majority of Western culture's uh, digestive system of not eating a normal diet that's designed for the human organism. Um, things like fruits and vegetables and meats and, um, you know, of course, many schools of thought in diet. I don't want to get into too much of what my personal school of thought on diet is, but just eating food, real food, right? Not, not um, artificially uh, created products posing as food. Um, so that's my little soapbox there. But um, so I wanted to talk about two here, um, just a couple differentials in terms of um, herbal remedies for the digestive system. So when I think of digestive herbs, I tend to kind of think of them in two primary categories um, in terms of herbal actions. And I think of this as kind of the, the polar spectrum of herbal medicines as they impact the, the digestive system. On the one end of the spectrum, we have our carminatives. Now, carminatives um, are essentially our warming, 
drying for the most part drying and warming herbs energetically um, and they tend to have an antispasmodic action so they tend to relax um, smooth muscle they tend to be uh, circulatory stimulant so they're going to increase circulation to the whole digestive system um, they're going to warm and bring blood flow kind of warm and relax and circulate and many of these plants are our aromatic plants. So most carminative remedies will have aromatic essential oils present in them, um, things that you can just smell and they smell very aromatic, right? So this would be, you know, I would say my top three um, are, I can't, it's hard to say my top three, but the three that oftentimes come to mind for me as some of the best carminatives would be things like peppermint, right? Very aromatic. Um, fennel seeds are like that as well. Um, all pretty much actually really a majority of the mint family, um, the, the, um, that whole mint family are aromatic carminative plants. So peppermint and spearmint and um, things like lemon balm or basil, holy basil, um, uh, just the whole spectrum, uh, oregano, um, so many of the, a lot of our culinary herbs actually are also carminative remedies. So a lot of our, a lot of the herbs that are in your kitchen cabinet are carminatives and on the one hand they taste great right they add nice flavor and improve the flavor of our food but they also have this great uh, benefit also of being a digestive stimulant so we typically think of carminative remedies when people have like gas and bloating and um things like like distension of the belly and um, kind of what we would consider like wind tissue states like too much air too much wind or in Ayurveda they would say excess vata so kind of coldness tension cramping wind gas and those carminatives help to kind of disperse that excess wind relax the tension warm up and bring blood flow to the area and in general just kind of help to help an upset tummy uh, for the most part so um, very broad spectrum of plants there um, and from all different types of plants too um, you see lots of root medicines but also leaves um, and seeds um, as far as parts of the plants being used there as well but my top three I really love peppermint I really love fennel I love chamomile a lot for that that's a really great three-part triplet carminative formula it's a good base for a formula that's a nice constitutionally balanced triplet too because um, Fennel tends to be primarily warming in its action. Peppermint is kind of like mixed warming and cooling and chamomile is going to be more on the cooling side. So it's kind of a nice constitutionally balanced three-part formula there. I also love angelica root as a carminative. Um, that would be different from Dong Kwai, the, the Chinese prepared angelica. This would be more of our Western angelicas. Um, so, so we have our carminatives, right? That's a primary category for digestive herbs. Then on the other side of that, we have our bitters, right? And, and bitters uh, I see as being very different from our carminatives in the sense that bitters primarily are going to be cooling and drying, whereas the carminatives tend to be more warming and drying. And the bitter category of herbs, uh, very popular, um, kind of been used um, for, since time immemorial, right, for digestive health. Um, many people are aware of the benefits of bitters, but I think a lot of people are um, not aware of the potential dangers of bitters. And I think the primary thing we want to look at there is the humoral or the energetic effect of bitter plants which again is going to be primarily having a very cooling uh, drying effect upon the constitution as a whole so if you have a person that's very cold and thin and dry and kind of a vata constitution um, then they're probably not going to be the best um, they're probably not going to be the best kind of constitution to give a very strong bitter uh, plant or bitter formula to unless that is you were to uh, formulate those bitter plants with some other remedies that would warm it up like some carminatives right so um, so the bitters whereas carminatives are more kind of relaxant and antispasmodic and warming and increasing circulation the bitters are more kind of a direct stimulant to the whole digestive apparatus. So stimulating the liver and the gallbladder to produce and secrete more bile, stimulating the stomach to secrete more hydrochloric acid and enzymes, the um, 
stimulating the pancreas to secrete more enzymes, all the small and large intestine, all those juices just secreting, everything is secreting. Um, now because everything is secreting, right, it's, uh, these would be called exocrine glands, um, which are secreting organs that secrete fluids, those fluids are entering your digestive system and then ultimately leaving your body, right, so um, that in that sense they are constitutionally as a whole um, going to be drying plants, but because they're uh, acutely kind of short-term increasing secretions in a local area, it can actually moisten a local area. Um, so they kind of have a localized moistening effect, but an overall constitutional drying effect that has to be observed when you're using bitter plants. Now that doesn't mean that every single plant that's bitter is going to be cold, right? We have this, um, this great category of remedies that's kind of this mix of um, bitters and carminatives, what, uh, what we would call like an aromatic bitter or a fragrant bitter. And these are typically plants that have um, uh, obviously a very bitter taste, but they also have aromatic essential oils in them, which kind of warms them up a little bit. My two favorites here are calamus root, Acorus calamus, um, which is a, a, a remedy used um, in Ayurveda, but was also used in the Western traditions as well. It's a great uh, aromatic bitter. Um, I love calamus. I use that remedy a lot. Um, and actually this pond that you see behind me here, uh, we've got a whole bunch of calamus root kind of in our little nursery um, that we're going to be planting around this pond and kind of do growing calamus here on the land. Um, and this, my second favorite aromatic bitter is, is mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris. Um, of course, many different species of mugwort, Artemisia douglasii, um, lots of Artemisias. Pretty much the whole Artemisia genus actually is um, filled with fragrant aromatic aromatic bitters. Um, you have things like wormwood, artemisia absinthium, sweet annie, artemisia annua, um, all of your sagebrush, the artemisia tridentata that grows out here on the west coast or more east of the Cascades. Um, a lot of those artemisias are very bitter plants, but they also have those aromatic essential oils, uh, which kind of balances it out. So it's almost like a formula unto itself. And that's one thing I like to think of um, with herbs in general is start to look at a single plant and break down all of the different actions, all of the different organ systems that plant works on. And if you really look at it, each herb is kind of a, a formula unto itself. And I think that's a great way to think about our plants. I think it's a great way to study our plants because um, when you think of an herb like a formula, and you really understand all the dynamics and nuances of that single plant, sometimes you can find one plant that hits everything that a person needs. And that's, a, that's what we would call a specific medicine, a specific remedy, um, which is really the whole premise of um, uh, oftentimes like the homeopathic perspective is trying to find that specific remedy. Uh, the eclectic movement um, in North America here was based on specific medication and um, Flower essences oftentimes are, it's nice to use flower essences in that way. If you can just find that one remedy that really matches the whole state of that person is ideal there. Um, so for me, and I didn't really talk about true bitters, um, but so some, some, just some examples of great true bitter plants that don't have the aromatic quality. My two top ones, I love um, Oregon grapefruit. Uh, the Mahonia uh, nervosa or Mahona, uh, Mahonia aquifolium, and of course dandelion root, Taraxacum officinale, great, uh, reliable, solid, bitter remedies there. Um, a little bit on the stronger side though, I really love greater celandine, uh, Chelidonium magus. This is a remedy um, that was much more commonly used in the European tradition. It's a very strong uh, liver stimulant in the poppy family. Um, that's a very strong bitter plant. Um, so lots of bitter, bitter plants out there, but I just wanted to share some of my favorites. And so to me, when you're thinking about a digestive formula, it's good to maybe think of doing a mixture of carminatives and bitters, right? So really looking at your client, okay, what's the constitution of this person? Is they, are they um, tend to be cold and dry? Do they tend to be hot and dry? Are they cold and moist? Um, do we want to warm them up or cool them down? Do we want to dry them out or do we want to moisten them? 
and um, really starting to think through your formula in that way too. So if you have someone that tends to be more on the hotter side and the damper side, you might think about having more bitters in that formula and less carminatives or flip it and kind of adjust your ratios of those different plants. So uh, just to talk about formulation a little bit there, I think that's a great way to think through um, a simple digestive formula. I think a good broad spectrum digestive formula should have both bitters and carminatives um, in it as a general formula, unless your client really just needs carminatives or just needs bitters. Now, of course, there's lots of other herbal actions that are excellent for the digestive system. We've got our demulcent remedies to moisten everything up. We've got our anti stronger antispasmodics for cramping and things like that, um, but really, um, I would say the foundation of all digestive formulas are rooted in bitters and carminatives. And so I just wanted to share that with you so you can start thinking through how to organize and differentiate your Materia Medica. And of course, as you're studying your digestive Materia Medica, you want to look at kind of the other overlapping qualities of, uh, of your remedies. Um, so for example, one of my favorite ways of thinking these through is you can take your bitters and your carminatives, but then you can look at which ones of those are also nervines, right? Which ones are also um, kind of calming and relaxing for the mind and for the nervous system. So in the bitter category, we have things like hops, right? Hops is a very bitter plant. Um, we have skullcap, which is also a nice bitter uh, nervine sedative relaxant. Now valerian is also bitter, but valerian is a little bit complex. It has some bitter principles, but it's primarily warming. So I don't tend to think of valerian as a true bitter per se. It does have some bitterness to it for sure, but valerian's primary taste is acrid, uh, making it more of an antispasmodic and a relaxant. Um, and it also has a lot of essential oil in it, making it a little bit more of a carminative, but it does kind of, valerian does kind of tread that boundary between bitter and carminative, but it's also a very strong relaxant for the nervous system. And um, now then we can think of the carminatives, right? We've got lemon balm is a great relaxant uh, nervine sedative um, that's uh, carminative. We have catnip. Um, a lot of those mint family plants are like that as well. The, the Tulsi, the holy basil, um, just a couple examples off the top of my head there that I can think of. So there you see, okay, someone that maybe has a digestive issue, but they also are nervous. They're also anxious. They also have kind of some nervous tension or they're really stressed out or like a nervous stomach. Well, now you can kind of dial that in a little more and say, okay, I don't just want a carminative and a bitter, but I want a carminative and a bitter that are also going to be sedative. Right, so maybe rather than choosing Oregon grape and dandelion, you choose something like hops and motherwort, and instead of something like peppermint and spearmint and fennel, you choose something like lemon balm and catnip and Tulsi, right? So that's, so that's not just a, a digestive form. That's not just a digestive bitter formula or a carminative form. That's also a nerving formula, right? So this is how you start stacking your herbs together and your overlapping properties to get a holistic formula to treat the wholeness of the person. So I just wanted to illustrate that kind of formulation principle because with clinical herbalism, formulation is a huge part unless you're going to practice uh, simpling there. So, so those are some of the general categories, a couple remedies, a couple formulation strategies that I like to just think through um, when I'm thinking about the digestive system. Of course, there's tons of other um, holistic approaches to treatment of the GI, bone broth being really, really important. To me, bone broth, I really think of it as a part of my Materia Medica. Um, it's just an animal medicine as opposed to an herbal medicine, but I really think of bone broth as, as a medicine. Um, we have, uh, so the bone broth being very important, obviously probiotics being very important, fermented foods, cultured foods, very, very important, um, as well as obviously dietary regulation and, um, and things like that. So 
So I just wanted to share a little bit um, with you here about the digestive system. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'd be curious to hear about some of your favorite herbs for the digestive system. Maybe post them below. I always love hearing from all of you guys. Please hit the share button, hit the like button, share this video with your family, your friends, your community. And if you're interested in learning more about the digestive system, holistic treatment, um, of the GI as well as the liver and the gallbladder, I'm going to be doing a full four day workshop focused just on the digestive system and the hepatobiliary system in the first workshop of my advanced clinical herbalism workshop series. Uh, this is a new workshop series that I'm um, offering to, uh, to the public this year. Last year it was available only to graduates of my evolutionary herbalism program, but this year I'm opening it up for anyone to come. I'm really excited about it. And in this, um, that specific workshop, we're gonna be learning about how to, how to assess the digestive system, the liver and gallbladder, how to determine what's going on there, the energetics, the constitution, how to cultivate good interview and intake skills. We're gonna talk about formulation principles, um, detoxification strategies for the liver. We're gonna, I'm gonna teach you a whole gut restoration protocol um, and elimination diet. So how to guide people through essentially a, a six to 12 week process of completely restoring and replenishing and rejuvenating the digestive system um, through diet, through herbal medicines, and through various protocols that I've devised over helping people um, restore their digestive system for years now. Um, as I said, this is a, a kind of the foundation, I would say, of my entire herbal practice. So I'm really excited to be uh, offering these workshops. There's five workshops in the whole series. Um, um, each one focusing on two different organ systems of the body and uh, each weekend we're going to go through various methods of holistic evaluation, pulse and tongue analysis, medical astrology, intake and interview skills to how to develop your herbal career, to how to um, how to keep your notes organized, to how to track your books, to how to get clients, to how to keep clients, um, really looking at the what are all the skills and tools and resources that you need in order to effectively practice herbalism clinically, professionally, as a career. Um, so giving you all the skills you need to, to succeed um, in your work as an herbalist, but also to succeed in, in the treatment of your clients and giving you all the therapeutic strategies that you need to know um, in order to treat all of the different organ systems of the body. So to learn more about these workshops, uh, there's a link underneath this video. Uh, click that link to check out the workshop schedule. We've got five of them, five four-day workshops happening this year. You're able to sign up for either just one, one of the workshops or a couple of the workshops, or you get a discount if you sign up for the whole series, uh, your food and lodging lodging is included in the price. Um, I'm also going to be sending you after the workshop recordings of the full workshop so you can revisit the material as often as you need. Um, and you'll also get a pretty big packet of notes for, for that workshop. As I, um, as any of my past students know, I tend to over deliver. I tend to give a lot of content and a lot of materials in my workshops, not to mention we have a whole lot of fun out here on the land at the School of Evolutionary Herbalism. So thank you all so much for checking out this video. I hope this finds you well. I hope you learned something good. Again, please post your questions and comments below. What are your favorite digestive herbs and and uh, hit that like button or, or don't hit the like button if you didn't like this video, um, but just share some feedback with me. And uh, if you're watching this anywhere but my blog, head on over to evolutionaryherbalism.com. Got lots of free, free goodies over there and lots more content and videos for you. So thanks so much, everyone. I'll, um, I'll be in touch with you next week with another video covering a different organ system. Thanks so much. Take care and be well.